for anxiety. Ansiedad is the code. Metaphysics and epistemology, like the natural sciences, are factual subjects. Their concern is to describe the universe and man's means of knowledge. Ethics or morality, I use the terms as synonymous here, is an evaluative subject. Its concern is not only to describe, but also to prescribe for man. Ethics is the branch of philosophy that, in Ayn Rand's words, provides a code of values to guide man's choices and actions, the choices and actions that determine the purpose and the course of his life. According to objectivism, such a code must deal with three basic interrelated questions. For what end should a man live? By what fundamental principle should he act in order to achieve this end? Who should profit from his actions? The answers to these questions define the ultimate value, the primary virtue, and the particular beneficiary upheld. What's up, Henry? How you doing, bro? Getting ready to start some uh, biomedic, biomagnetic paratherapy on my daughter, Katie. I 
seven, the good. Metaphysics and epistemology, like the natural sciences, are factual subjects. Their concern is to describe the universe and man's means of knowledge. Ethics or morality, I use the terms as synonymous here, is an evaluative subject. Its concern is not only to describe, but also to prescribe for man. Ethics is the branch of philosophy that in Ayn Rand's words provides a code of values to guide man's choices and actions, the choices and actions that determine the purpose and the course of his life. According to objectivism, such a code must deal with three basic interrelated questions. For what end should a man live? By what fundamental principle should he act in order to achieve this end? Who should profit from his actions? The answers to these questions define the ultimate value, the primary virtue, and the particular beneficiary upheld by an ethical code and reveal thereby its essence. The objectivist position can be indicated in three words. The ultimate value is life. The primary virtue is rationality. The proper beneficiary is oneself. Because of its evaluative nature, ethics has always posed a unique problem to philosophers, even to those who had no doubts about man's power to reason or to know the facts of reality. How, thinkers have wondered from the Greeks to the present, can value judgments ever be proved? How can facts, any or all of them, lead logically to estimates such as good or evil, right or wrong? desirable or undesirable? How can a knowledge of what is validate a conclusion stating what ought to be? For centuries, since the atrophy of the religious approach to philosophy, the consensus among ethicists has been that these questions are unanswerable. Ethics, according to the received wisdom, is arbitrary. It is a field ruled by subjective feelings, dissociated from reality, reason, science. In this view, there is no disputing about value judgments. There are no objective grounds on which to choose between production and theft, thought and evasion, Jesus and Judas, Jefferson and Hitler. As its name suggests, objectivism denies this denial of morality. Yep. Ayn Rand holds that facts, certain definite facts, do lead logically to values. Are... What ought to be can be validated objectively. Yep. Ethics is a human necessity right and, and a science, not a playground for mystics or skeptics. Objectively right the principles of morality are a product not of feeling, but of cognition. Now let us see how to achieve cognition in this kind of field. Life as the essential root of value. The key to an understanding of ethics lies in its central conduct, value. Specifically, the key lies in the concept existential basis and cognitive context. This is the proper starting point of the field, which must precede the three issues I mentioned above. The first question to ask is not what values should man accept, but rather, does man need to judge and select values at all? Is morality necessary or not? And if it is, why? To answer this question, one must know what the concept of value denotes. This is where Ayn Rand, the ethicist, begins. She does not treat morality, neither the field as such, nor any theory within it, as a primary. What facts of reality, she asks, give rise to the subject? Like every concept, value is reached and defined on the basis of observation. One must isolate a group of similar concretes, then integrate them into a new mental unit. The crucial datum here is the fact of goal-directed action. Ayn Rand defines value as that which one acts to gain and or keep. Value denotes the object of an action. It is that which some entity's action is directed to acquiring or preserving. As this account suggests, the concept of value implies specific preconditions. In Ayn Rand's words, value presupposes an answer to the question of value to whom and for what. It presupposes an entity capable of acting to achieve a goal in the face of an alternative. Where no alternative exists, no goals and no values are possible. This last point requires elaboration. Goal-directed behavior is possible only because an entity's action, its pursuit of a certain end, 
can make a difference to the outcome. Alternative does not necessarily imply choice. It means that the entity is confronted by two possible results. Either it acts successfully, gaining the object it seeks, or it does not, and thus fails to gain the object. To put the point negatively, an object is outside the field of value if action in relation to it is inapplicable or necessarily ineffectual. If one is guaranteed to have a certain thing or not to have it, no matter what one's actions, then the thing is not an object one acts to gain and or keep. For example, an alternative exists as to whether an animal gains food or whether a man gains a knowledge of the law of gravitation. Food and knowledge are not guaranteed to an entity, no matter what it does. To be attained, each of these requires action, physical and or mental. But no alternative exists in regard to the metaphysically given fact of gravitation itself, which is beyond anyone's power to affect. Accordingly, one cannot wonder, should I pursue this fact or flee from it? The fact is not open to either course. In this kind of instance, there is no alternative and therefore no possibility of goal setting. The fact as such can be neither desirable nor undesirable. It simply inexorably is. The metaphysically given, as we have seen in chapter one, must be accepted without evaluation. The concept of value presupposes an entity capable of generating action toward an object, an object that requires action if it is to be attained. These two presuppositions of value, need of a valuer and of an alternative, are not independent factors. They are corollary aspects of a single condition. The very observations that lead to the concept of value entail the next step in Ayn Rand's analysis. One does not observe desks or pebbles pursuing goals. One does observe men, animals, and plants doing so. Living organisms are the entities that make value possible. They are the entities capable of self-generated, goal-directed action, because they are the conditional entities which face the alternative of life or death. They are thus the only kind of entities that can and must pursue values. Ayn Rand describes the alternative of life or death as fundamental. Fundamental means that upon which everything in a given context depends. There is, she writes, only one fundamental alternative in the universe, existence or non-existence, and it pertains to a single class of entities, to living organisms. Let us expand on this important formulation. The realm of existence is the metaphysical fundamental. It is that which every concrete and every issue presupposes. According to objectivism, this fact has a critical application to the field of values. The alternative of existence or non-existence is the precondition of all values. If an entity were not confronted by this alternative, it could not pursue goals, not of any kind. The simplest way to clarify this point is to concretize Ayn Rand's example of the immortal robot. Such a robot not facing the alternative of life or death requires no action to sustain itself. It is an entity which moves and acts, but which cannot be affected by anything, which cannot be damaged, injured, or destroyed. Imagine for a moment that this sort of entity were possible. What values could it act for? If the thing asked for suggestions, what goals could you recommend? Could you tell it to enjoy a good meal? Since the robot has no need of nutritive action, it has no mechanism of ingesting or digesting nutriment, no hunger for things without food, no pleasure sensation from it. The subject of food and drink is outside its concern. What about advising it to go to the dentist so as to avoid the agony of a toothache? This robot does not have toothaches or any need of teeth. Since it cannot be damaged, it need not concern itself with health or illness. To it, such concepts are inapplicable. Could you urge the thing at least to come in out of the rain? The elements had no effect on an indestructible entity. Once we remove the alternative of life or death, we remove the possibility of need satisfaction or need frustration, at least on the physical level, since need in this context denotes that which is required for survival. We thereby remove also the sensory incentives, the pleasure and pain sensations, which accompany need satisfaction or frustration in conscious creatures. 
on about the psychological level. Can the entity, assuming it were to have a conceptual faculty, pursue goals that are not mediated by purely animalistic needs? Can abstract knowledge, say, be a value to it? What for? The robot has no use for knowledge as an aid in achieving its ends. So far, it has no ends. Is money a value? To buy what? So far, the robot has no use for material objects or services, neither a Rolls Royce, it has no place to go, nor an army of men servants. It has no jobs to be done. Is a trip around the world a value, a relaxation, say, or rest? Rest from what? The thing does not engage in work. Is having the love of friends a value to it? This begs the question. Friends are men who share the same values. In order to have a friend, one must first hold some values. What about the pursuit of happiness? Same answer. Happiness is the emotion that proceeds from the achievement of one's values. It presupposes that one holds values. But what about recommending the simplest hedonism? Doing anything it feels like doing merely because it feels like it, regardless of reasons. Same answer again. Feelings presuppose value judgments, which are precisely what our robot still lacks. On both the physical and the psychological levels, this entity would be passive unconcerned, uninterested. Since nothing makes any difference to it, it would be unable to initiate a step in any direction. Even though, in our hypothesis, many alternatives confront the robot, to learn science or not, to buy a car or not, etc., none leads it to goal-directed action. There are no grounds for it to pursue one side of any alternative against the other. There are no grounds because the fundamental alternative the value-generating alternative does not apply in its case. There is no to be or not to be. To an indestructible entity, no object can be a value. Only an entity capable of being destroyed and able to prevent it has a need, an interest, if the entity is conscious, a reason to act. The reason is precisely if to prevent its destruction, i.e. to remain in the realm of reality. It is this ultimate goal that makes all other goals possible. Goal-directed entities do not exist in order to pursue values. They pursue values in order to exist. Only self-preservation can be an ultimate goal, which serves no end beyond itself. This follows from the unique nature of the goal. Philosophically speaking, the essence of self-preservation is accepting the realm of reality. Existence exists. The realm of non-existence, if one wants to use such a term, is not a competitor to reality, as General Motors is to Ford, with some kind of advantages to be considered and weighed. The realm of non-existence is nothing. It isn't. Since only existence exists, it is the fundamental starting point in every branch of philosophy. Metaphysically, one cannot go outside the realm of existence, e.g. by asking for its cause. Epistemologically, one can employ the faculty of reason in such a quest, e.g. by asking for the reason why, in coming to conclusions, one should accept the realm of reality. This would be an attempt, futile on its face, to engage in reasoning while standing outside existence. The attempt is futile because reason cannot be neutral in this kind of issue, not even provisionally or momentarily. Reason is the faculty of knowing that which is. A reason detached from reality with no special allegiance to that which is, impartial and unbiased as between reality and unreality, would not be a cognitive faculty. The same principle applies in regard to evaluation. Here, too, reality is the starting point. And one cannot engage in debates about why one should prefer it to nothing, nor can one ask for some more basic value, the pursuit of which validates the decision to remain in reality. The commitment to remain in the realm of that which is, is precisely what cannot be debated, because all debate and all validation takes place within that realm and rests on that commitment. About every concrete within the universe and about every human evaluation of these, one can in some contexts ask questions or demand proofs. In regard to the sum of reality as such, however, there is nothing to do but grasp. It is. 
and that if the fundamental alternative confronts one, bow one's head in a silent amen, amounting to the words, this is where I shall fight to stay. That, in effect, is what plants and animals and rational men do. It is why they act and what they act for. Such is the deepest reason why an indestructible robot has to be devoid of values. Thus we reach the climax of Ayn Rand's argument. Only the alternative of life versus death creates the context for value-oriented action, and it does so only if the entity's end is to preserve its life. By the very nature of value, therefore, any code of values must hold life as the ultimate value. All of the objectivist ethics and politics rests on this principle. An ultimate value, Ayn Rand observes, is the end in itself which sets the standard by which all lesser goals are evaluated. An organism's life is its standard of value. That which furthers its life is the good. That which threatens it is the evil. Period. Without an ultimate goal or end, she continues, there can be no lesser goals or means. Metaphysically, life is the only phenomenon that is an end in itself, a value gained and kept by a constant process of action. Epistemologically, the concept of value is genetically dependent upon and derived from the antecedent concept of life. To speak of value as apart from life is worse than a contradiction in terms. It would be a stolen concept. Or, as she puts this last point in Atlas Shrugged, in her most important summarizing formulation, it is only the concept of life that makes the concept of value possible. The distinctively objectivist viewpoint here, let me repeat, is not that life is a precondition of other values, not that one must remain alive in order to act. This idea is a truism, not philosophy. Objectivism says that remaining alive is the goal of values and of all proper action. Man's life as the standard of moral value. Now let us see how the principle of life as the standard of value applies to specific kinds of organisms of all to man. Plants and animals initiate automatically the actions their life requires. Such entities may encounter adverse conditions beyond their capacity to cope with such as drought, temperature extremes, or an absence of food. In addition, an animal's knowledge may prove inadequate. A large-scale example would be the lemmings that unwittingly swim out too far and perish. But whatever the conditions they encounter and whatever an animal's knowledge, there is no alternative in the functioning of these organisms. Within the limits of their ability, they act necessarily to attain those objects that sustain their existence. They can be destroyed, but they cannot pursue their own destruction or even be neutral in regard to it. Implicitly, life is their inbuilt standard of value, which determines all their goals and actions. Man, however, is the living being with a volitional, conceptual consciousness. As such, leaving aside his internal bodily processes, he has no inbuilt goal or standard of value. He follows no automatic course of action. In particular, he does not automatically value or pursue self-preservation. The evidence of this fact is overwhelming. It includes not only deliberate suicides, but also people's frequent hostility to the most elementary life-sustaining practices. As examples, one may consider the Middle Ages, or the more mystical countries of the Near and Far East, or even the leaders of the modern West. For a human being, the desire to live and the knowledge of what life requires are an achievement, not a biological gift. Like every entity, man has a nature. Like the other organisms, he must follow a specific course of action if he is to survive. But man is not born knowing what that course is, nor does such knowledge well up in him effortlessly. He has to seek out the knowledge and then decide to act on it. Man, writes Ayn Rand, has to hold his life as a value by choice. He has to learn to sustain it by choice. He has to discover the value it requires and practice his virtues by choice. How is he to discover all this? That is the purpose of morality. Morality, in Ayn Rand's definition, is a code of values accepted by choice, and man needs it for one reason only. He needs it in order to survive. 
moral laws in this view are principles that define how to nourish and sustain human life. They are no more than this and no less. Morality is the instruction manual in regard to proper care and use that did not come with man. It is the science of human self-preservation. Plants and animals pursue values, but not moral values. They have goals, but not ethics. Moral values are a subcategory of values defined by two conditions. Moral values are chosen values of a fundamental nature. They are fundamental in the sense that they shape a man's character and life course. Other kinds of value, by contrast, are specialized, e.g. a man's estimates in regard to government or art, which constitute not his moral but his political or aesthetic values. The last seven paragraphs offer a broad overview of a complex issue which now requires detailed analysis. Until we understand step by step the exact purpose and role of morality in man's life, there is little point in our proceeding further in the field. The first step here is the fact that man needs to act long range. Long range means allowing for or extending into the more distant future. A man is long range to the extent that he chooses his actions with reference to such a future. This kind of man sets goals that demand action across a significant time span, and being concerned with such goals, he also weighs consequences, the future consequences of his present behavior. By contrast, a man is short range if, indifferent to the future, he seeks merely the immediate satisfaction of an impulse, without thought for any other ends or results. An animal has no need or capacity to be long range, at least not in the human sense. An animal does not choose its goals. Nature takes care of that, so it can act safely on any impulse. Within the limits of the possible, that impulse is programmed to be for life. But man cannot rely safely on random impulse. If he is to protect his life, he has to assess any potential action's relationship to it. He has to plan a course of behavior deliberately, committing himself to a long-range purpose, then integrating to it all of his goals, desires, and activities. Only in this way can the attainment of an ultimate purpose become an issue within his conscious control. An action undertaken by a short-range mentality may lead accidentally to a beneficial result. If one swallows, buys, befriends, or votes for whatever or whomever one stumbles across on the spur of the moment, without reference to reasons, purposes, or effects, one may get away with it for a while, but only for a while. Consistency in regard to any goal beyond the perceptual level or the routine cannot be achieved by sense perception, subconscious habit, or luck. It can be achieved only by the aid of explicit values and knowledge. No one could expect to reach the big sail uptown by pointing his car north, then steering at random with no map, no plan, no knowledge of turning points or detours, no concern but the impulse of the moment. To reach a sail, however, is a modest quest. To preserve one's life is a more difficult task. For any living organism, the course of action that survival demands is continuous, full-time, all-embracing. No action an organism takes is irrelevant to its existence. Every such action is either in accordance with what self-preservation requires, or it is not. It is for the entity's life, or against it. This is true even of so innocuous an action as a man's taking a nap. In one context, if he is tired after work, say, and needs to unwind, such an action may be beneficial. If he does it on the job, however, it may lead to unemployment. If he does it outdoors during a blizzard, he may never wake up. The principle involved in this simple example applies to every choice one makes. It applies to one's choices in regard to career, friends, investments, psychotherapist, entertainment. It applies whatever the form and scale of a choice's effects, which may be obvious or subtle, major or minor. The point is that every choice has effects, which redound directly or indirectly on one's ability to survive. Life is motion. If the motion is not self-preserving, then it is self-destroying. Self-destroying action need not be immediately fatal. There is such a thing as a drawn-out destruction, a state of affairs in which one is neither healthy nor 
dead, but in the process of moving from one condition to the other. Thus, it is possible to deteriorate gradually for years, breathing all the while, but increasingly damaged. An obvious medical example, which has many counterparts that do not involve substance abuse, would be a long-term alcoholic or drug addict. In certain of these cases, though by no means all, the damage may be reversible if one changes one's course in time before the result becomes irrevocable. But none of this alters the fact that damage is damage, nor does it alter the fact that damage unintended is progressive. Such a negative cannot be deliberately courted or even passively tolerated, not if self-preservation is one's goal. The size and form of the damage are relevant here. No threat to vitality, no undermining of one's capacity to deal successfully with the environment can be countenanced if life is the standard of value. The reason is that no such threat can be inflicted safely on so complex and delicate an integration as a living organism. In a biological context, suffering only a little damage is comparable to taking only a little cyanide or playing only an occasional game of Russian roulette. Life does not mean flirting with death and cannot be achieved by such means. In regard to the issue of being long-range, there are differences among conscious species. A purely sensory organism knows nothing of the immediate moment. The higher animals, however, do and must project the future to some extent. They do it within the limits of their perceptual form of awareness. An animal's life, as Ayn Rand points out, consists of a series of separate cycles repeated over and over again, such as the cycle of breeding its young, or of storing food for the winter. Each of these cycles is undertaken afresh as a separate unit, without connection in the animal's awareness to the cycles of its past or future. An animal cannot grasp or deal with the total of its lifespan and does not need to do so. In this respect, too, Ayn Rand observes, man is unique. Man's life is a continuous whole. For good or evil, every day, year, and decade of his life holds the sum of all the days behind him. Man can and must know not merely tomorrow's requirements or this season's, but every identifiable factor that affects his survival. He can assess not merely the proximate, but also the remote consequences of his choices. It is not enough for him to consider the chance of a toothache next week. He also needs to know whether he is courting bankruptcy next month, an anxiety attack next year, an invasion of human predators in the next decade, or a nuclear holocaust in the next generation. With the advent of the human species, the need to protect the future reaches its climax. The temporal scale of man's concern must be not any isolated day or cycle, but his entire lifespan. Just as man's knowledge must be integrated into an all-encompassing sum, so must his actions. If he is to succeed at the task of survival, Ayn Rand concludes, man has to choose his course, his goals, his values in the context and terms of a lifetime. Here, then, is the problem. Man must be long-range. He must know the survival significance of every action he takes and he must know it in relation to the time span of an entire human life. The problem is, what can make such a cognitive feat possible? The answer is, the same kind of consciousness that makes it necessary. Man can retain and deal with so vast a quantity of data only by the method of unit reduction. He can gain knowledge of decades still ahead of him only by means of the faculty that integrates perceived concretes to an unlimited number of unperceived but similar ones, past, present, and future. He can achieve the long-range outlook he needs only by the use of concepts. If man is to sustain and protect his life, he must conceptualize the requirements of human survival. This means that he must confront the array of human choices and actions in all its bewildering complexity and achieve unit economy. He must ask, what are the fundamental choices, the ones which shape all the others? And what abstractions integrate all the instances of such choices from the aspect of their relationship to self-preservation? In other words, what generalizations identify in condensed, retainable form 
platform, the effect on man's life of different kinds of choices. An adult determines whether a previously unperceived object is a man, an animal, or an automobile by applying to the new experience his earlier formed concepts. The man who has conceptualized the requirements of survival decides by a similar epistemological method whether or not in any particular case to tell a lie, or to work for his keep, or to compromise his convictions, or to give to charity. What's up, Vince? Fight in the dancing dictatorship. Long he decides see, not bro. by feeling or by polls, and not by trying to assess each new situation without context, as though he were an infant, but by the application of his earlier formed moral concept. The common name of this latter form of cognition, which extends far beyond moral issues, is principle. A principle is a general truth on which other truths depend. Every science and every field of thought involves the discovery and application of principles. Leaving aside certain special cases, a principle may be described as a fundamental reached by induction. Such knowledge is necessary to a conceptual consciousness for the same reason that induction and the grasp of fundamentals are necessary. A moral principle, accordingly, is not something sui generis. Properly speaking, it is a type of scientific principle identifying the relationship to man's survival of the various basic human choices. A man who acts on moral principle in this sense is neither a martyr, a zealot, nor a prig. He is a person guided by man's distinctive faculty of cognition. For a rational being, principled action is the only effective kind of action. To be principled is the only way to achieve a long-range goal. In the objectivist view, moral principles are not luxuries reserved for higher souls or duties owed to the supernatural. They are a practical, earthly necessity to anyone concerned with self-preservation. Exactly. The only alternative to action governed by moral principle is action expressing short-range impulse. But for man, as we know, the short-range, viewed long-range, is self-destructive. This is the practical point missed by pragmatism, which tells people to judge each choice not by reference to abstract theory, but only by its results after it has been tried, which insists that today's results need not recur tomorrow and which urges that each situation be approached experimentally, on its own terms. Such a philosophy amounts to the declaration, drop your mind, discard your capacity for thought, decide each case perceptually. This is precisely what man cannot do, not for long. The objectivist morality, I have said, defines a code of values. By code, he Ayn Rand means an integrated, hierarchically structured, non-contradictory system of principles, which enables a man to choose, plan, and act at long range. Man needs such a code, as should now be clear, not merely because he has free will, but because he is a living organism who must learn to use his free will correctly. He needs a moral code because his life requires a specific course of action, and being a conceptual entity, he cannot follow this course except by the guidance of concepts. What then is the standard of moral value? A valid code of morality, Ayn Rand concludes, a code based on reason and proper to man, must hold man's life as its standard of value. All that which is proper to the life of a rational being is the good. All that which destroys it is the evil. Let me repeat that the standard inherent in the whole argument is man's life. Man's life, or man's survival qua man, means, in Ayn Rand's definition, the terms, methods, conditions, and goals required for the survival of a rational being through the whole of his lifespan in all those aspects of existence which are open to his choice. To state the point another way, man's life means life in accordance with the principles of human survival. The objectivist standard of morality is not a momentary or a merely physical survival. It is the long-range survival of man, mind, and body. The standard is not staying alive by any means, because once we speak in long-range terms, there is only one means of sustaining human life. As Ayn Rand puts it, 
the standard is not survival at any price, since there's only one price that pays for man's survival, reason. Man's life is not a separate or higher ideal arbitrarily added to life. It is merely the standard of life applied to man. Life for any living creature means life as that creature, life in accordance with its specific means of survival. There is no dichotomy between existence and identity. To be for a man is to be a man. Any standard of morality other than objectivisms can have only one ultimate result. Since life requires a specific course of action, Ayn Rand observes, any other course will destroy it. To support her point, we have more than the evidence of theory. We also have the sobering spectacle of all the countries and centuries that tried some version of non-life as their standard. They got what they asked for. Rationality is the primary virtue. What are the principles of human survival? What objects must man hold as values if he is to preserve his life? And what virtues must he practice in order to achieve them? The faculty of reason is man's basic tool of survival. The primary choice is to exercise this faculty or not. If life is the standard, therefore, the basic moral principle is obvious. It tells us the proper evaluation of reason. According to Ayn Rand, there are three basic values, which together are the means to and the realization of one's ultimate values. No. To live, man must hold three, three things, things as the supreme and ruling values of his life. Reason, reason purpose, purpose self-esteem. Self reason as his own tool of knowledge. Purpose as his choice of the happiness which that tool must receive. Your to choice. Self-esteem as his inviolate certainty that his mind is competent think and his person is worthy of happiness which means is worthy of living self-efficacy these self three values imply and require all of man's virtues the last two of these i will defer until the next chapter the greatest of them however which makes the others possible is the first reason epistemology tells us that reason is valid it is man's means of knowledge ethics draws the practical conclusion if one chooses to live, one must hold reason as a value. To value reason is the opposite of the thing, but also of accepting it dutifully. In regard to the mind, the objectivist is not disinterested or grudging. He does not say, I myself would rather be irrational, but since A is A, I agree not to hold contradictions. On the contrary, grasping the vital role of consciousness he awards reason fundamental place in his personal value structure. He is the man who cherishes his means of survival, who recoils from the prospect of subverting it, who is uplifted by the spectacle of dry objectivity. The noblest act you have ever performed, said Ayn Rand, is the act of your mind in the process of grasping that two and two make four. She did not intend the statement as hyperbole. The magnificent fire in Ayn Rand's ethics, her inspiring affirmations of man and the hero, creative work, selfish joy, individual liberty, all of it is derivative. The root is the primary moral estimate of objectivism, its estimate of reason. Every moral value entails a lifelong course of virtue. Virtue, in the objectivist definition, is the action by which one gains and keeps a value. Action in this instance, the virtue that develops, preserves, and applies the faculty of reason, thereby making possible every other human value, is rationality. Rationality, according to Ayn Rand, is the recognition and acceptance of reason as one's only source of knowledge, one's only judge of values, and one's only guide to action. This means the application of reason to every aspect of one's life and concerns. It means choosing and validating one's opinions, one's decisions, one's work, one's love, in accordance with the normal requirements of a cognitive process, the requirements of logic, objectivity, integration. Put negatively, the virtue means never placing any consideration above one's perception of reality. This includes never attempting to get away with contradiction, a mystic fantasy, or an indulgence in context dropping. 
Rationality means the acceptance of reason as a principle of human survival and as an absolute. Animals exercise their faculty of consciousness automatically. Man does not. For an animal, writes Ayn Rand, the question of survival is primarily physical. For man, primarily epistemological. Rationality, accordingly, is the primary obligation of man. All the others are derivatives of it. If man needs to choose his actions by reference to principles, this virtue names the root principle. Indeed, it underlies the very need of moral principles. To act on principle is itself an expression of rationality. It is a form of being governed by one's conceptual faculty. By the same token, there is only one primary vice, which is the root of all other human evils, irrationality. This is the deliberate suspension of consciousness, the refusal to see, to think, to know, either as a general policy because one regards awareness as too demanding or in regard to some specific point because facts conflict with one's feelings. Vice, in the objectivist view, is not a rewarding policy. It is unconsciousness, willful self-induced unconsciousness, while one continues to move around and function. To a conscious organism, no course of behavior can be more dangerous. 11. The above is a generalized overview. Now let me consider certain aspects of rationality in greater detail. To begin with, one cannot follow reason unless one exercises it. Rationality demands continual mental activity, a regular daily process of functioning on the conceptual level of consciousness. This involves much more than merely forming up concepts to be able to speak or read a book. In Ayn Rand's description, it involves an actively sustained process of identifying one's impressions in conceptual terms, of integrating every event and every observation into a conceptual context, of grasping relationships, differences, similarities in one's perceptual material, and of abstracting them to new concepts, of drawing inferences, of making deductions, of reaching conclusions, of asking new questions and discovering new Thank answers you. and expanding one's knowledge into an ever-growing sum. A man does not qualify as rational if he walks around in a daze, but once in a while, when someone mentions a fact, he wakes up long enough to say, I'll accept that, then relapses again. Rationality requires the systematic use of one's intelligence. Ayn Rand's novels abound in instructive examples of this aspect of virtue. Consider, for instance, Howard Rourke's encounter with the Dean at the beginning of The Fountainhead. The Dean tells him that men must always revere tradition. Rourke regards this viewpoint as senseless, but he does not ignore it. <coughs> Rourke is not a psychologist, nor does the field interest him much, but he does deal with men. He knows that there are many like the Dean, and he is on the premise of understanding what he deals with. So he identifies the, the event in the terms available to him. There is something here opposite to the way I function, he thinks. Some form of behavior I do not grasp. The principle behind the being, he calls it. And he files this observation in his subconscious with the implicit order to himself, be on the lookout for any data relevant to this problem. Thereafter, when such information becomes available, new examples or aspects in new contexts, he recognizes and integrates it. In the end, by a process whose steps the reader has seen, Rourke reaches the concept of the second hander and of the opposite kind of man whom he represents. At that point, he grasps what the issue is on which his own fate and that of the world depend. Whatever the heroes in Ayn Rand's novels deal with, including work, romance, art, people, politics, and philosophy, they seek to understand it by connecting the new to what they already know and by discovering what they do not yet know. They are men and women who like and practice the process of cognition. This is why they are usually efficacious and happy individuals who achieve their values. Their commitment to thought leads them to a sustained growth in knowledge, which maximizes the possibility of successful action. In citing the Rourke example, I do not mean to suggest that rationality has to involve the discovery of new ideas. The exercise of reason 
lies within the sphere of each man's knowledge, concerns, and ability. The point is not that one must become a genius or even intellectual. Contrary to a widespread fallacy, reason is a faculty of human beings, not of supermen. The moral point here is always to grow mentally, to increase one's knowledge and expand the power of one's consciousness to the extent one can, whatever one's professional or the degree of one's intelligence. Mental growth is possible on some scale to every person with an intact brain. It requires the expenditure of effort, however, the effort of initiating and maintaining a state of full consciousness. Effort does not mean pain or duty, but it does mean struggle, because conceptual knowledge is a volitional attainment that involves the risk of error and the need of continual scrupulous mental work. The men of virtue are the men who choose to practice and welcome this kind of struggle on principle as a lifelong commitment. Their opposites are the anti-effort mentalities who seek to coast through life, hoping that knowledge and values will somehow materialize without labor or cost, whatever one wishes for them. This attitude represents the solution of virtue at the root. It is resentment of the fact that virtue is necessary. The best symbol here is the Garden of Eden before the fall, which the Judeo-Christian tradition regards as paradise. Such a projection elevates mental stagnation to the status of ideal. No long-range action is required of Adam and Eve. No work, no plan, no focus. They need merely lie around, munch fruit, and follow orders. The mental practice that underlies the anti-effort attitude is the act of evasion, of blanking out some fact of reality which one dislikes. This act constitutes the essence of irrationality and therefore of evil. Evasion is the objectivist equivalent of a mortal sin. It is the only such sin that we recognize because it is what makes possible every other form of moral corruption. No one seeks to evade the total of reality. Evaders believe that the practice is safe because they feel they can localize it Ultimately, however, they cannot. The reason is that everything in reality is interconnected. In logic, therefore, to sustain an evasion on any single point, one would be forced gradually to expand and to keep expanding the scope of one's blindness. For example, suppose that you decide to evade only in regard to the issue of God's existence, which you want to accept without evidence. In regard to everything else, you say you will follow reason. What in pattern will happen to your mental processes thereafter? Can you remain rational in dealing with the rest of metaphysics, including such topics as the eternity of the universe, the absolutism of identity, and the impossibility of miracles? Any of these topics, squarely faced, threatens to expose and upset your evasion. What about your thinking in regard to epistemology, including your view of the arbitrary and the issue of faith versus reason? What about ethics and God's supposed moral commandments? What about God's reputed political views, e.g. on pornography, prayer in the schools, abortion? What about the clash between Genesis and the theory of evolution? If you tried consistently to protect only your single starting evasion, turning aside methodically from everything that might threaten it, directly or indirectly, that single evasion would lead you step by step to one ultimate result, total non-perception. The above is the negative expression of a principle discussed in chapter four, man's need of integration. Just as every idea has a relationship to one's other ideas, and none can be accepted until it is seen to be an element of a single cognitive whole, so every fact has a relationship to other facts and none can be evaded without tearing apart and destroying that kind of whole. Mm -hmm. In actuality, our discussion of a methodically consistent evader is merely a pedagogical device. An evader is not concerned with consistency. He does not seek to protect his evasion by identifying conscientiously the implications of new cognitive material. If that were his policy, he would not be evading. The evader's method is not to follow his evasion logically, wherever it leads, but to ignore logical relationships. His method is to deal with ideas and facts piecemeal, accepting or rejecting disconnected bits of content at random, 
by reference to FEMA. The evader does want the safety of localizing the evasions, and he practices the only method there is of achieving such localization, not knowing his evasions implications. This means that he discards the principle of integration. By its nature, evasion is a form of non-integration. It is the most lethal form, the willful disintegration of mental contents. A man in this condition no longer has the means to determine consistency or contradiction, truth or falsehood. In his consciousness, all conceptual content is reduced to the capricious, the baseless, the arbitrary. No conclusion qualifies as knowledge in a mind that rejects the requirements of cognition. Thus, the real evader, like the hypothetical one I mentioned first, reaches only one end and one kind of safety, all-encompassing blindness. This is the explanation of Ayn Rand's statement that a concession to the irrational invalidates one's consciousness. The mind can no more tolerate a little irrationality than the body can tolerate a little malignancy. Both evils, once introduced, start to consume any healthier elements. Every virtue, according to objectivism, has two aspects. One intellectual, the other existential. Since man is a unity made of mind and body, every virtue has an application in both realms. Each involves a certain process of consciousness and, as its expression in reality, a certain course of physical action. The existential side of rationality is the policy of acting in accordance with one's rational conclusions. There is no point in using one's mind if the knowledge one gains thereby is not one's guide in action. This aspect of rationality subsumes several obligations. It requires that one choose not only his abstract values, but also his specific goals by a process of rational thought, as against choosing some goal by an act of whim while dropping the full context of one's knowledge and of one's other goals. It requires that one know what his motives are, as against drifting through a day or a life, pushed one knows not where by unidentified impulse. It requires that one choose the means to his end by reference to explicitly defined principles, both moral and scientific, as against trying to build a bridge, a newscast, a marriage, or world peace by the aid of concrete bound habit, undigested slogans, or the seat of one's pen. And it requires that one then enact the means, accepting the law of causality in full, as against seeking effects without causes or causes without effects. This last issue needs elaboration. To seek effects without causes means to desire a certain object, perhaps a perfectly legitimate one, but take no action to gain it. The individual in such a case relies on the fact that he wants or prays for the effect. If one asks him, but how will it ever be achieved? His answer, often merely implicit, is evasion, somehow. If a man wants a certain effect, it is his responsibility to discover and enact the necessary cause. If he wants a fulfilling love affair, for instance, he cannot sit in his lonely apartment pining for a soulmate somehow to materialize. He must define what specifically he seeks in a woman and then start looking actively for her. Or if a woman wants a career as a writer, she cannot forever put off writing while waiting for inspiration somehow to strike. She must find the means to create her inspiration and then pick up a pen. The same principle applies to the desire for wealth, happiness, freedom, or any other value. It is not enough to say, X is a good thing, I want it. Since neither God nor society can perform a miracle, the policy of Christian hope is the opposite of virtue. Like every living thing, including in their own way the lilies of the field, a human being, if he is to gain his ends, must toil and serve. A particularly irrational variant of the above vice is the attempt to reverse cause and effect. In this case, the individual wishes for an unearned effect, but only as a senseless means to an end. He hopes that the effect somehow will provide him with the cause which he refused to enact or achieve. As examples, Ayn Rand cites people who want 
unearned love, as if love, the effect, could give them personal value, the cause, or who want unearned admiration, as if admiration, the effect, could give them virtue, the cause, or who want unearned wealth, as if wealth, the effect, could give them ability, the cause. In all such cases, the individual does not actually want the ostensible object of his quest, such as love or money. He wants the meaning of the object. He wants the pretense that he has achieved its cause while evading the fact that he hasn't and that he never intends to achieve it. The converse error is to seek causes without effects. This means taking a certain action while evading and expecting to escape its consequences. We have already mentioned alcoholics and drug addicts who shut their eyes to self-destructiveness of their behavior. The same phenomenon exists in many other forms. An example is the people who regularly want more favors from the government or more bureaus, while ignoring the escalation of controls this involves and the political denouement it forebodes. Many of these people do not want dictatorship any more than an alcoholic wants the DTs, and they have the ability to know the effect of their actions, yet they demand every step that leads to the omnipotent state while blanking out the future. The motto of all such people is, I can get away with it, but A is A, and they can't, not long range. The policy of evading causality, whether one wishes somehow to gain or to escape an effect, is a form of placing an I wish above an it is. In this respect, it is like all the other variants of irrationality. As we saw in chapter five, the only alternative to the acceptance of reason is emotionalism. This brings me to the topic of virtue and emotion. In epistemology, we concluded that emotions are not tools of cognition. The corollary in ethics is that they are not guides to action. Ayn Rand defines whim as a desire experienced by a person who does not know and does not care to discover its cause. Such a person does not wish to introspect or to analyze. He does not seek to identify the premises that underlie his desire or to determine whether these premises conform to reality. He simply wants a certain item. He wants it because he wants it. This is what Ayn Rand calls whim worship. Whim worship is to ethics what mysticism is to epistemology. The two practices are invalid for the same reason and lead to the same destructive results. The proper approach in this issue is not reason versus emotion, but reason first and then emotion. This approach, as we have seen, leads to the harmony of reason and emotion, which is the normal state of a rational man. His feelings, accordingly, are the opposite of whims. They are consequences of rational, explicitly identified value judgments. A man with this kind of psychology and self-knowledge does not repress his desires. He is eager to feel and to give his feelings full reality in the hours and choices of his life. To him, such a policy is a form of expressing in action the judgment of his mind. The desires of a rational man are stronger than those of a whim worshipper. The reason is that the rational man experiences his values in undiluted form. Since he has identified and integrated his mental contents, every aspect of them contributes to his certainty. Nothing in his premises or psychology tames the fire of his passion. If a man wants to eat his cake and have it too, he is necessarily torn, unsure of his direction, self-doubtful. The very contradiction mutes the intensity with which he can desire either side of it. But if a man wants something with the unbreached dedication of a person who knows his own mind and knows that his desire is in full accordance with reality, then he wants it. In ethics, as in epistemology, there is no dichotomy between reason and emotion. Once again, the truth is, think and you shall feel. I must add that anyone, for perfectly innocent reasons, may in some issue experience a clash between emotions and ideas. The rational course, then, is to defer action on the issue until the clash has been resolved. First, one should discover where one's error lies and correct it. Then one can act. 
assuming time permits such deliberation. It doesn't. If some emergency requires an immediate decision, then the person in conflict has to act without full self-knowledge. In such a case, he must be guided by his mind, i.e. by his best conscious judgment of what is consonant with reality, even if his emotions protest. When the crisis is over, he can inquire into the source of his emotional descent and reestablish mental harmony. This completes our first discussion of virtue. The decline of the West, someone once observed, can be symbolized by the fact that the term virtue, which comes from vir, Latin for man, has been turned upside down across the centuries. It has evolved from meaning manliness in a man to meaning chastity in a woman. Objectivism restores the term's original sense. We mean by virtue the kind of action appropriate to a human being. The action is rationality. The individual as the proper beneficiary of his own moral action. Now let us turn to the last of the three basic ethical oh. questions. The question of the proper beneficiary. Oh, yeah. The answer involves a distinction between the standard of ethics itself. and the purpose of ethics. An ethical standard, writes Ayn Rand, means an abstract principle that serves as a measure or gauge to guide a man's choices in the achievement of a concrete specific purpose. That which is required for the survival of man qua man is an abstract principle that applies to every individual man. The task of applying this principle to a concrete specific purpose, the purpose of living a life proper to a rational being, belongs to every individual man and the life he has to live is his own. Each individual must choose his values and actions by the standard of man's life in order to achieve the purpose of maintaining and enjoying his own life. Thus, objectivism advocates egoism, the pursuit of self-interest, the policy of selfishness. Yes. The concept of egoism identifies merely one aspect of an ethical code. It tells us not what acts a man should take, but who should profit from them. Egoism states that each man's primary moral obligation is to achieve his own welfare, well-being, or self-interest. These terms are synonyms here. It states that each man should be concerned with his own interests. He should be selfish in the sense of being the beneficiary of his own moral actions. Taken by itself, this principle offers no practical guidance. It does not specify values or virtues. It does not define interests or self-interest, neither in terms of life, power, pleasure, nor of anything else. It simply states, whatever man's proper self-interest consists of, that is what each individual should seek to achieve. The alternative is the view that man's primary moral obligation is to serve some entity other than himself, such as God or society, at the price of subordinating or denying his own welfare. In this view, the essence of morality is unselfishness, which involves some form of self-sacrifice. Though I have often implied the objectivist position on the present question, it is only at this point that I am able to address the issue explicitly. The reason is that egoism, like every other principle, requires a process of validation, and until now the context needed to prove and properly interpret egoism had not been established. In the objectivist view, the validation of egoism consists in showing that it is the corollary of man's life as the moral standard. Only the alternative of life versus death, I said earlier, creates the context for value-oriented action. And only self-preservation, I said, can be an ultimate goal. Now I need merely add the emphasis required to bring out the full meaning of these formulations. The alternative with which reality confronts a living organism is its own life or death. The goal is self-preservation. Leaving aside reproduction to which every organism owes its existence, this is the goal of all automatic biological processes and actions. When a plant turns its leaves to reach the sunlight, when an animal digests food or regulates its internal temperature, or turns at a sudden sound to discover the source, 
the organism is pursuing the values its survival demands. As a living entity, each necessarily acts for its own sake. Each is the beneficiary of its own actions. Plants and animals may not, however, be described as egoistic. The term self-sustaining covers the facts of their kind of behavior. Concepts such as egoistic, along with its synonyms and antonyms, such as selfish, altruistic, selfless, are moral terms. These terms apply only to an entity with the power of choice. They designate a mode of functioning that has been adopted in the face of an alternative. Plants and animals do not have to decide who is to be the beneficiary of their actions. Man does have to decide it. In the case of man, self-sustaining behavior is not pre-programmed. Even though man's bodily processes are guided automatically by the value of life we saw earlier, he must decide as a conscious entity to accept life as his moral standard. A similar point applies in the present issue. Even though man's bodily processes aim automatically at self-preservation, he must decide as a conscious entity to accept this end as his moral purpose. Because his consciousness is volitional, man must choose to accept the essence of life. He must choose to make self-sustenance into a fundamental rule of his voluntary behavior. The man who makes this choice is an egoist. Egoistic, in the objectivist view, means self-sustaining by an act of choice and as a matter of principle. The wider principle demanding such egoism is the fact that survival requires an all-encompassing course of action. A man's life cannot be preserved, not in a long-range sense, if he views the task as a sideline serving some other kind of goal. If an action of his is not for his life, then, as we have seen, it is against his life. It is self-inflicted damage, which uncorrected is progressive. This principle applies without restriction to every aspect of a man's actions. It is particularly obvious, however, when the aspect is not some complex means or lesser ends, but the ruling goal of a man's existence. To accept anything other than one's own life in this kind of issue, to incorporate into one's ultimate purpose any variant or tinge of self-denial, is to declare war on life at the root. Life requires that the man gain values, not lose them. It requires assertive action, achievement, success, not abnegation, renunciation, surrender. It requires self-tending, in other words, the exact opposite of sacrifice. A sacrifice is the surrender of a value, such as money, career, loved ones, freedom, for the sake of a lesser value or a non-value. If one acquires an equal or a greater value from a transaction, then it is an even trade or a gain, not a sacrifice. A rational man, however, chooses his values and their hierarchical ranking not by whim, but by a process of cognition. To tell such a man to surrender his values is to tell him, surrender your judgment, contradict your knowledge, sacrifice your mind. But this is something a man dare not sacrifice. The process of thought requires a man to follow the evidence wherever it leads, without fear or favor, regardless of any effect such action may have on the consciousness of others. He must follow the evidence whether others agree with his conclusions or not, whether their disagreement is honest or not, whether his conclusions accord with their wishes or not, whether his conclusions make them happy or not. Since thought is an attribute of the individual, each man must be sovereign in regard to the function and product of his own brain. This is impossible if morality demands that a man place others above self. Yep. There is no dichotomy between epistemology and ethics, which means in this issue between the process of cognition and its beneficiary. A man cannot offer unswerving allegiance to logic if he holds that his moral duty is to surrender his conclusions in order to satisfy unchosen obligations to others. He cannot guide his faculty of awareness by the dictates of his own independent judgment if he believes that he is rightfully a mere means to the ends of others and that his mind, therefore, is their property. He cannot combine in the same consciousness the status of cognitive sovereign with that of moral serf.
be concerned with one's own interests applies in every realm of endeavor, including, above all, the realm of the intellect. There can be no interest greater to a rational being than the interest in his tool of survival, which can function only as his tool of survival. Just as the basic value, man's life, requires the ethics of egoism, so does the primary virtue. Rationality requires that a man be able righteously to say, my mind is my means of achieving my goals in accordance with my judgment of fact and of value. The most selfish of all things, as Ayn Rand puts the point, is the independent mind that recognizes no authority higher than its own and no value higher than its judgment of truth. We are often told that the pursuit of truth is selfless since a personal interest acts as an agent of distortion. The premise underlying this claim is that man's goals are necessarily irrational, therefore that he faces an agonizing dilemma to uphold either truth or his interests, reason and reality, or his values. If a man's goals are not irrational, however, they demand of him a recognition of facts. In such a case, the discovery of truth is an eminently selfish policy because it is an indispensable means to attaining one's ends. It is not selfless to know what one is doing and why. If a man's personal interest is the passion to live and succeed in reality, that motive is the incentive to the most rigorous objectivity he can practice, on the premise that ignorance is not bliss. By contrast, if one had no personal interest in knowing facts, or if he viewed facts as the enemy of his values, what would prompt him to undertake the challenge of cognition? The truth is the reverse of the conventional notion. Selflessness is not the precondition of objectivity, but its obstacle. In actuality, the selfless is the mindless. Whether one studies the nature of life, of value, of virtue, or of cognition, the conclusion is the same. To be, for a rational being, is to be selfish by an act of choice. The objectivist view of the nature of selfishness is implicit in the validation of the principle. The principle arises within the context of the requirements of man's survival. These, therefore, determine the principle's proper interpretation. Ayn Rand upholds rational self-interest. This means the ethics of selfishness, with man's life as the standard of value defining self-interest, and rationality is the primary virtue defining the method of achieving it. Within the objectivist framework, indeed, the term rational self-interest is a redundancy, albeit a necessary one today. We do not recognize any self-interest for man outside the context and absolute of reason. In the objectivist interpretation, the principle of egoism subsumes all the values and virtues already discussed, along with all those still to be discussed. Egoism requires non-contradictory goals, long-range thought, principled action, and the full acceptance of causality. The selfish man, in short, is no other than the rational man, because he recognizes that any default on rationality is harmful to his well-being. The contrapositive of this point is that irrationality is unselfishness. Unfortunately, for a reason I shall soon indicate, egoism has been advocated through the centuries mainly by subjectivists. The result is several corrupt versions of egoism, which most people now regard as the self-evident meaning of the concept. So I must keep stressing the fact that objectivism upholds objectivity and therefore rejects all these versions. We reject the idea that egoism permits the evasion of principles. Reject the equation of egoism with irresponsibility, context dropping, or whim worship. We reject the notion that selfishness means doing whatever you feel like doing. The fact that you feel like taking some action does not necessarily make it an action compatible with your interests in the legitimate sense of that term. There are countless examples of people who desire and pursue self-destructive courses of behavior. One such course consists of a person sacrificing others to himself. 
Since egoism is a principle of human survival, it applies to all human beings. Every man, according to objectivism, should live by his own mind and for his own sake. Every man should pursue the values and practice the virtues that man's life requires. Since man survives by thought and production, every man should live and work as an independent, creative being, acquiring goods and services from others only by means of trade, when both parties agree that the trade is profitable. A proper discussion of all these points will occupy us during subsequent chapters. At this stage, I want merely to dissociate Ayn Rand's approach from the subjectivist idea of dealing with others. Egoism in the objectivist interpretation does not mean the policy of violating the rights, moral or political, of others in order to satisfy one's own needs or desires. It does not mean the policy of a brute, a con man, or a beggar. It does not mean the policy of turning other men, whether by clubs or tears, into one's servants. Any such policy, as we will see in due course, is destructive not only to the victim, but also to the perpetrator. It is condemned as immoral, therefore, by the very principle of selfishness. The best formulation of the objectivist view in this issue is the oath taken by John Galt, the hero of Athos Shrunt. I swear by my life and my love of it that I will never live for the sake of another man, nor ask another man to live for mine. The principle embodied in this oath is that human sacrifice is evil, no matter who its beneficiary is, whether you sacrifice yourself to others or others to yourself. Man, every man, is an end in himself. If a person rejects this principle, it makes little difference which of its negations he adopts. Whether he says, sacrifice yourself to others, the ethics of altruism, or sacrifice others to yourself, the subjectivist version of egoism. In either case, he holds that human existence requires martyrs, that some men are mere means to the ends of others, that somebody's throat must be cut. The only question then is your life for their sake or theirs for yours. The question does not represent a dispute about a moral principle. It is nothing but a haggling over victims by two camps who share the same principle. Objectivism does not share it. We hold that man's life is incompatible with sacrifice, with sacrifice as such of anybody to anybody. We reject both the above theories on the same ground. As Ayn Rand states the point in the fountainhead, the rational man rejects masochism and sadism, submission and domination, the making of sacrifices and the collecting of them. What he upholds and creates is a self-sufficient ego. People often ask if there are not conflicts of interest among men, e.g. in regard to work or romantic love, which requires someone's sacrifice. Objectivism answers that there are no conflicts of interest among rational men who live by production and trade, who accept the responsibility of earning any value they desire and who refuse to make or accept sacrifices. There is a conflict of interest, if one wants to call it that, between a banker and a bank robber, but not among men who do not allow robbery or any equivalent into their view of their interests. The same applies to all values, including romantic love. This latter example is discussed in Atlas Shrugged. Now, having removed the worst obstacle to understanding egoism, its equation with the vicious act of sacrifice, let us consider the relationship of self to others afresh. Let us consider this subject as one would approach it in a proper culture, where lengthy polemics against vice would be unnecessary. The essential fact to grasp here is that social existence is an asset to man in the struggle for survival. If we leave aside dictatorships, which are much less safe to their inhabitants than a desert island, the advantages of life in society are obvious. The two great values to be gained from social existence, writes Miss Rand, are knowledge and trade. Men can transmit from one generation to the next a vast store of knowledge, far more than any individual could gain by himself in a single lifetime. And if men practice the division of labor, 
an individual can achieve a degree of skill and the material return on his effort far greater than he could attain if he lived in solitude. Egoism, accordingly, does not mean that a man should isolate himself from others or remain indifferent to them. On the contrary, a proper view of egoism requires that a man identify the role of others in his own life and then evaluate them appropriately. Certain men, those who think, live independently, and produce, are of value to one another. They are of value by the standard of man's life and of each individual's own self-interest. Well. By the same standard, the opposite kinds of men, the evaders, the parasites, the criminals, are the opposite of a value. If one lives or deals with other men at all, their moral character is relevant to one's own survival and can be an issue of enormous significance to it, for good or for evil. To concretize this principle further, one need merely project the effects on one's well-being that would flow from living in a society made up of goose-stepping Nazis, or of the American founding fathers, or of mindless rabbits out of Main Street, or of men such as John Galt and Francisco Dancona in the Atlantis of Atlas Shrunk. The above principle introduces a broad new context for the pursuit of value. It oh, brings yeah. us to the realm of personal relationships. When men evaluate the moral character of others, as we saw in chapter four, they yeah. respond in Thank you for joining us. feeling esteem and affection yeah, for those individuals whose values they share. The result is the phenomena of admiration.